They're a very edifying group, believe me. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're continuing to move through this letter to the church at Corinth, coming close to the end of it, but in, but in the most significant chapter of the letter, the 15th chapter, the most significant statements in terms of a, of a body of material given on the resurrection of Jesus in all of the scriptures. So we're asking today as we begin looking at verses 12 to 19, how significant is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ? I want to ask you to stand with me and follow along as I read from my Bible those verses, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 19. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And you say, well, I believe in the resurrection, Pastor. An increasing number of people around you, inside the church and outside the church, do not. It is critical that we embrace with a deeper conviction than ever before and with a bold determination we will not budge one inch from the historical reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the floodgates are open to deny this. And yet, there are serious implications if he's not raised. Thank you. Please be seated. What's the significance of it? Significance of the cross and resurrection, as Joshua said earlier, there's this, the whole hymn and can it be is predicated on the reality that Christ died and rose again according to the Scriptures. Paul Tripp says it this way, The cross is evidence that in the hands of the Redeemer, moments of apparent defeat become wonderful moments of grace and victory. At the center of a biblical worldview is this radical recognition. The most horrible thing that ever happened was the most wonderful thing that ever happened. Consider the cross of Jesus Christ. Could it be possible for something to happen that was more terrible than this? Could any injustice be greater? Could any loss be more painful? Could any suffering be worse? The only man who ever lived a life that was perfect in every way possible, who gave his life for the sake of many, and who willingly suffered from birth to death in loyalty, who is calling, was cruelly and publicly murdered in the most vicious of ways. How could it happen that the Son of Man could die? How could it be that men could capture and torture the Messiah? Was this not the end of everything good, true, and beautiful? If this could happen, is there any hope for the world? Well, the answer is yes. There is hope. The cross was not the end of the story. In God's righteous and wise plan, this dark and disastrous moment was ordained to be the moment that would fix all the dark and disastrous things that sin had done to the world. This moment of death was at the same time a moment of life. This hopeless moment was the moment when eternal hope was given. This terrible moment of injustice was at the very same time a moment of amazing grace. This moment of extreme suffering guaranteed that suffering would end one day once and for all. This moment of sadness welcomed us to eternal joy of heart and life. The capture and death of Christ purchased for us life and freedom. The very worst thing that could happen was at the very same time the very best thing that could happen. Only God is able to do such a thing. The same God who planned that the worst thing would be the best thing is your Father. He rules over every moment in your life, and in powerful grace He is able to do for you just what He did in redemptive history. He takes the disasters in your life and makes them tools of redemption. He takes your failure and employs it as a tool of grace. He uses the death of a fallen world to motivate you to reach out for life. The hardest things in your life become the sweetest tools of grace in His wise and loving hands. So be careful how you make sense of your life. What looks like a disaster may in fact be grace. 
What looks like the end may be the beginning. What looks like hopeless may be God's instrument to give you real and lasting hope. Your father is committed to taking what seems so bad and turning it into something that is very, very good. Why? How? The resurrection of the darkness of Calvary turned to the bright light of the empty tomb. And looking at this, this passage we're reading today, Paul says at the beginning, I proclaimed this to you. The, it was a first order, the thing that I preached, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried. He was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. And he says in our passage today, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? Of course, we know historically when Jesus was on the earth, Pharisees and the Sadducees formed two different uh, constituents. Pharisees were more like fundamentalists. Sadducees were more like liberals. Sadducees mocked the idea of life after death, of a, of a resurrection, the possibility of that. Jesus encountered them. Plato believed in dualism. The idea that, that man was spirit and everything good about man was spirit. And everything bad about man was body. So the best thing that could happen to a man was to be separated, that his spirit be separated from his body. And it was a horrifying thought to Plato that these two would ever be united again. Man was freed when he was released from his body because the body was evil. And you have these different worldviews that have developed through the ages that challenge the idea of resurrection. And the Old Testament teaches resurrection. You could read psalm after psalm where resurrection is asserted. You can read in the prophets the idea of resurrection. I want us to begin seeing today in these verses seven implications, seven horrific things that would be true if Christ is not raised from the grave. First, Christ would not be risen. If there's, if there's no resurrection, then Christ would not be risen. Second, the preaching of the gospel would be meaningless. What we're doing here today what I've done for more than 40 years of my life, what, what the Gideons are doing, passing out Bibles and telling the hope, would, would be meaningless. Faith in Christ would be worthless. To ask someone to trust in Jesus, to repent of your sin, and come to trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior would be worthless. All witnesses to and all preachers of the resurrection would be liars. Not only would this be a meaningless exposition, I would be a liar to you. Resurrection is not true. All men would still be in their sins. All former believers, those who have already died, those, those who've gone before us, who trusted in Christ and set the model for us, they would be eternally perished. And Christians would be the most pitiful people on earth because we would be, well, we would be what, what our critics tell us. That we need crutches. That we need religion, as Marx said, as an opiate to dull our senses sensibilities. When Paul launches into these implications, he makes this first argument in 1 Corinthians 15, 12. If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection for the dead? When you break that apart, you realize the language he's using in the, in the Greek, it's not even if, it's, it's since Christ is proclaimed. This is the message. But it's also true that some of you are denying it. Corinthians generally believed in resurrection, the, the, that Christ has been raised. The, the, the verb tense there is that it's something that happened in time past, and it continues to be a reality today. It has lasting implications and reality. Going on from there, having made this assertion, he demonstrates that the resurrection is not only possible, but is essential to the faith. He gives seven 
what John MacArthur calls disastrous consequences. And MacArthur breaks them up into what he, the four theological, first four, and then the last three personal. Let's look at 15, 13. Christ would not be risen. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. We're approaching April 21st, Easter Sunday. We've said here through the years, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday. We gather on the first day of the week because Christ rose on the first day of the week. There's an annual celebration with high and holy significance. Brothers and sisters, if those, there's no resurrection, what we celebrate every Sunday, what we live in the hope of every day, what we celebrate on the 21st with great intensity, increased devotion. Not true. Not even Christ is raised if the dead do not rise. And yet we've already read through these earlier verses where Paul cites all these witnesses to the resurrection and the group of 500 who were gathered. Secondly, the preaching of the gospel would be meaningless. Verse 14, the first part of that, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. He said in the earlier part of this chapter, unless you have believed in vain, he said, here's what I preached. This is what you believe. This is what you were tr trusted in and responded to and said, yes. But he says, if there's no resurrection, then I am wasting your time and mine. It's the, it's the attitude it, when Peter, after Jesus died and they were so grieved that their great hopes they had in Jesus being Messiah and ushering in what they understood, really what they misunderstood, to be the way the kingdom would come. Peter says at one point after that, I'm going fishing. Jimmy, we might as well be fishing today if there is no resurrection. Vanity. We're not gathered here today as one, one professor uh, that I heard years ago said, now when the disciples went to the tomb, uh, they didn't come back with a, with a piece of hair or a, or a or horn cloth or, or anything that, that they could hang on to and say, here is proof of a, of a real physical resurrection. No, they went forth with the hope that Jesus had risen in their hearts. That is hogwash. You might as well believe in the tooth fairy. They went forth from an empty tomb. They experienced shortly after that a resurrected Savior. It is vanity otherwise. This exercise is vanity. You should get your money back. Jesus is not risen. Preaching is vanity. Third, faith in Christ would be worthless. Think of the people who prayed for you, the people who taught you, the people. Who, if, if there's no resurrection, then my mother, from the earliest days of my life, when she would sit me on my knee and I push my memory back as far as my memory can go, and she's singing to me, Jesus loves this I know. Well, the Bible tells me so. And she's reading the scriptures to me and telling me the story of Jesus. And the Sunday school teachers who poured into me, people who challenged me through the years, trust the Lord Jesus. Those whom you've challenged, we would be challenging them to something that would have no value at all. They might as well believe in the Easter Bunny. They might as well believe in Santa Claus if there's no resurrection. Serious consequences. See, well, why are you saying this, preacher? Because you see, there are some people who claim to be followers of Christ who want to try to get along with the world, and the world doesn't believe in resurrection. The world believes that when you die, you just become food for worms. 
And so people want to soften it and tone it down and say, well, we, don't, we want to try to find a connecting place. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You don't find a connecting place by surrendering the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you don't challenge people to think about life after this life. People who've got it all figured out, got their lives laid out, who, who know what they're going to do going forward, who know that what their goals are, and you press them and press them and say, okay, so you've got it all figured out. What about after life? What about when you die? Challenge them to think about then. Because the typical Westerner today will tell you, that's it. That's why I'm going to grab all the gusto I can. I only go around once in life. No, we've got to think about resurrection. Because they, they'll be resurrected too. The second death. To eternal damnation. Challenge someone to trust in Christ would be a worthless ambition. Your faith is in vain, he says. Fourth, all witnesses to creatures of the resurrection would be liars. And this is, Paul is saying this of himself. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. That's a charge that's been made of him by his peers. When he turned his back on Judaism, walked away from Pharisaism, became a follower of Jesus Christ, that's what they were saying. He's a blasphemer. They took an oath they would not eat until they had his head on a platter, until they had killed him. He said, but oh no, if there's no resurrection, here's where God's misrepresented. If we're preaching something not true. If we testified about God, that he raised Christ. Peter said this at Pentecost, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised from the dead. We'd be speaking falsehood about that. Paul says, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. So he's establishing this in a very strong way that you must believe in resurrection. Every now and then you read about a theologian, I'm thinking of one real popular theologian, who uh, for a season, bless the Lord he turned, he's been greatly used through the years, who abandoned the idea of resurrection for the unconverted to eternal damnation. He couldn't. He believed that the unconverted dead were just simply went into annihilationism. That was it, that they simply ceased to exist. He's come back to that, thank God. No, resurrection applies to the saved and the unsaved. The saved, the sheep resurrected unto life eternal in heaven, the goats resurrected and cast into eternal damnation in the lake of fire, where the fire does not go out, where the worm consumes and never finally consumes. And then you have, fifthly, all men would still be in their sins. Verses 16 and 17, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Yet, lying preachers have told you you're forgiven of your sins if the dead are not raised. We're all headed to some place horrible if the dead are not right. Another implication. Verse 18, all former believers would have eternally perished. When we, when we come to a funeral, and I've done many over 40 plus years, and we've, you bury people and you wonder about some. I'm not one of these guys that preaches a person into heaven just because they died. But you've had some funerals that gloriously, gloriously celebrated. My friend R.F. Gates, when I had the privilege of preaching his sermon, his funeral sermon, Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. If there's no resurrection, then we're foolish. Talk in terms of no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sadness, no more sickness, no more weeping, all tears wiped away from our departed friends whom we would say, saved without a resurrection they've perished finally Christians should be most pitied if in Christ we have hope in this life only in other words coming to follow Christ to believe in Christ to understand the will and way and word of Christ to want to be like Christ 
is only a this life reality. It may make life better for you. You, you may uh, escape some hardships of, of a lifestyle that would be wanton and, and, and debauched and rebellious. But if we're living for Christ, looking for hope to live with Christ, and there is no resurrection, then people should pity us. Ooh. By the way, that's what the unconverted do. Well, if, if, you, if you need religion, if, if that helps you feel better and, and kind of helps you put life together, that's okay. If you need that, that's fine. Like, you need to take a Tylenol, take it. You need a sleeping pill, take your sleeping pill. You can rest better with that. They're pitying us as fools. And they're right to do so if there is no resurrection from. But there is resurrection from the dead. And we're going to begin looking next week, Lord willing, at verse 20, but I'm going to give you a preview. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits all those who've died. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves infallibly, undeniably, that you and I have a destiny, a date with destiny. And when we close our eyes on this planet, we will wake up in eternity with Him in glory or without Him in eternal torment. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives great hope to those who love Him. It gives great judgment to those who will not come to Him that they might have life. Do you know Him today? Do you know Him? Have you thought about life beyond this life? Have you bought into this silly notion by the un unconverted that there is no resurrection, that this is all there is? Oh, don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Don't let the enemy of our souls dull you into thinking this is all there is. This, this is a dress rehearsal for eternity. Last night, Linda Norman took us to see the screw tape letter. C.S. Lewis, very sobering, the view from hell. I pray to God, no one hearing my voice who is content to rock along, thinking there's no resurrection, and who will with that attitude absolutely land an eternal torment. Rather, I pray those of us who know Jesus Christ will be, have a new burning freshness about us to get the word out. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And you must trust Him if you're going to rise with Him. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we're thankful. We're thankful that you didn't let us get so educated that we thought we were too smart to take at face value what the Scripture teaches about Jesus. I'm thankful for childlike faith that simply believes what the book says. We're so grateful you sent Jesus. While we look with horror at the cross, we know that the very worst thing possible, you by grace, made the best thing possible for us. We're grateful that the tomb is empty today. While all the other religions of the world celebrate their leader around their tomb, we celebrate at the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Help us to live, as was sung earlier, under the watch care and leadership of the resurrected King 
and help us to live resurrected lives and tell to others it's appointed unto us once to die and after that the judgment for any here in the sound of my voice who are not yet followers of christ i pray you will meet them where they are, offer Jesus to them, and that they will receive him as their Lord and their Savior, and begin that journey to the promised land to be with him forever. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.